Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Town of Dover Mayor Tony Keats. Dover is a community located on Newfoundland and Labrador's east coast. The town is blessed with an abundance of natural beauty. Since being incorporated in 1971, Dover has become well known for the fault line that runs directly through their town, known as the Dover Fault. Dover's Fault Lookout has become the place where a love story was created and featured in the famous play Come From Away. Dover has some of the most beautiful coastal scenery, walking trails, lookouts, lighthouses, memorials, and a famous history. It's a great place to live and a stunning place to visit. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Tony Keats. In the heart of every thriving community lies a well-crafted strategic plan. But crafting such a plan requires expertise, experience, and a deep understanding of local needs. Enter Strategic Steps, your partner in municipal strategic planning. Strategic Steps team of experts have years of experience in municipal administration. At Strategic Steps, they just don't develop plans. They co-create homegrown strategies tailored to your unique community. They listen, they collaborate, they empower your community to thrive. Contact Strategic Steps today and take the first step towards a brighter future for your municipality. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona a little bit, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single other municipal leader who's ever come on the show, this question, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Tony? Um, I think it was uh, from years and years of growing up uh, in a family that uh, really, uh, really promoted and made sure that, you know, we got involved not only in the in in the community aspects of uh, municipal councils, but any uh, anything that could uh, better your community and better the people that are around you. So, uh, you know, I I I've said over the years that it's because of my parents. I I, I give full credit uh, that I've been uh, involved and and truly enjoy what I uh, what I I've done so far and uh, look forward to uh, continuing. To be honest with you, uh, Chris. Was politics something discussed at the dinner table growing up or where did your interest in politics come from? Did it come from mom and dad as well? Or is it something like me that you're the black sheep of the family and you want to get involved in uh, elected politics in some sense? Yeah, no, uh, you know, it, it, it came from the family, to be honest with you. I, I grew up, um, I was adopted uh, and I was the only kid around uh, at the time uh, uh, the next siblings to me was uh, 17 years older and they were moved out of the house when I came. Uh, so being home with my parents all the time and just had, you know, the, the, their contact and, and especially when around elections time, uh, uh, you know, they really supported uh, making sure that, you know, all of us knew that uh, you, you support the person, sometimes not the party. It's, uh, it's the person I remember my mom used to say, uh, you always support the person uh, and vote for the person because the party is not the one that works for you. You, the person who you elect, works for you. And and if they don't do the job that you want to do, uh, want them to do, so you, you know, in the next next election, you get rid of them and you move on. And and uh, you know, I, I grew up in a house. Sometimes, uh, you know, years ago, elections were a big thing, and and uh, you know, putting signs on your lawns and in your windows was was huge. Um, so, you know, I can remember growing up, we had, you know, one party, political party sign in one side of the window. On the other side of the window, we had another political party sign because my parents didn't agree on who to, uh, who to, um, who to uh, support. So, you know, and I grew up that way, uh, knowing that, you know, we had choices and, and the choices were ours and we wouldn't told who to vote for. Now, your career in municipal politics has spanned some decades, and I, I did a bit of research. So 1992 is when you first were elected. So this is your 34th year in municipal politics. And I've got to ask the stupid question here, but the important question, because we are a show that is across Canada, and we have listeners in Newfoundland and Labrador, but 
Has municipal politics changed dramatically in those 34 years since you were first elected in 1992? Yes, I, I, I think we talked about this last time I was on with, with Craig. And um, I found that, you know, first when I got involved back in 1992, uh, we used to show up to a meeting probably once a month. Uh, we had, you know, the day before we were probably given, you know, the, the minutes and the agenda. Um, and, and that was it. After the meeting, you know, you, you go again for another two to three weeks or, or a month before you had the next meeting. Uh, now it's an everyday uh, thing. I, I'm, I'm dealing with council and community issues, not only my community sometimes, because, you know, I'm also involved in, in the region. And, and uh, when we talk about joint councils, because, you know, that's one of the things that, that I also enjoy is making sure that the communities around us you know, uh, get the full rewards and, and, and we work together so that, you know, the benefits comes to all of us and, and we're not working for the same same goal Like when it comes to, you know, well, we need a piece of infrastructure and you need a piece of infrastructure. When that piece of infrastructure can do, you know, two to three to five communities, to be honest with you, and we don't need to spend the same money uh, if one of the communities got that piece of infrastructure that everybody can use. So the reason I asked that question again is because I want to ask the political follow-up question to that question now is I, I'm one of these nerds that likes to compare and contrast a little bit. Since you were elected in 1992, you have served, and I say served alongside 10 different governments in Newfoundland and Labrador's provincial government. You started yeah. with Premier Wells. You are now with Premier Fury. You have probably spanned the gambit of how relationships work with that provincial level of government. We are, municipalities are in that sort of weird spot right now where they're asking for a lot more from the federal and provincial governments. In your mm -hmm. time in office, do you look back on the different governments and say, I wish we would have went a little bit further with this government or wish I would have went a little bit further with this premier or this minister of uh, municipal, municipal affairs? Because now we are at a point where we're sort of looking for more than we probably should have been asking for compared to five years ago. Yeah, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, Chris, I, you know, I, I I sometimes don't look back, I look forward and, and you know, some of the premiers and some of the, the, the ministers that we've dealt with, you know, over those over those years that you just spoke about, uh, you know, some of them were easier to deal with, some were not so easy to deal with, especially when you're, when you're dealing with bureaucrats within that office. And sometimes bureaucrats do not change when, you know, the political stripe changes. Uh, but, you know, I, I've always said that we shouldn't be fighting so hard as we are. Uh, for you know what we need in our communities because you know we we do know what what is needed in our communities um, and struggling sometimes uh, with ministers and some ministers Chris to be honest with you don't even know what a municipality is you know they're they're, they're putting that portfolio uh, and they haven't deal with municipalities in the past or they haven't served on municipal councils or or deal with any municipal you know official uh, from the past so you know it's a learning curve for the, for those ministers. And it's a learning curve for ours because, you know, every time a minister changes, you know, we are the ones that got to try to uh, get that minister up to speed. And, 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 and that's where you lose a lot of time to, um, especially on critical issues. Uh, and, and we want to make sure that that government, and that, that, uh, that minister is working the best that they can for us. Uh, you know, when I was the president of municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, the biggest thing that we pushed was to make sure that we had that seat at the table. And there's nothing no worse when, you know, you're getting a call the day before that night saying, you know, can you come to a news conference and you get at the news conference and you really don't have a clue what's going on or what's going to be announced, to be honest with you. Uh, but, you know, you are a part of that news conference or a part of that funding uh, that's going to be announced. And I, I can remember saying to Craig, because Craig was the CEO at that time for municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, I said that was my last time ever going to a conference uh, to a, uh, a news uh, conference or a news you know, release that we don't know what's going on because if we're not to the table, we should not be at that news conference uh, you know, and, and, and propping up that minister or anybody else uh, and saying that they're doing a good job when, when really we never read our two cents in or you know, we never uh, let them know really what the necessarily funding should be going for. It's the same thing as the gas tax money now that, you know, we, the so-called gas tax money, the name has changed. But, uh, you know, we can only spend that on certain things within our municipality. You know, water and wastewater is, is the big thing. Uh, you know, and for instance, we just add a uh, in the last last year, we add um, 
uh, we were going to put 10 new fire agents in our community. Now, some people say, you know, 10 fire agents, no big deal. But, you know, when you're talking 663 people and residents, you know, that means a lot because our tax base is not very high. Um, you know, when we put it at the tender, it came back way over tender. And here in Newfoundland, when you're over tender, your community is the one that's left owing whatever the cost is over tender plus your 10% on, on a water and wastewater thing. So, you know, we tried to apply for the gas tax funding for that infrastructure, but it don't qualify, you know, and it's part of the water system, uh, but it don't qualify. That's, that, that leaves us, you know, saying, like, what is the justification behind the funding? Like, what, you know, why can't we spend the funding where we need to spend it, especially when, it's, when you're talking crucial infrastructure within your community? Uh, you know, and, and that's the biggest thing. Uh, and saying that, Chris, I can remember when I was president of municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, you know, in one year, I've had six different municipal ministers in that one year, uh, you know, and to say that was a struggle, that was a real struggle, uh, especially when you know some of them personally, because, you know, you're dealing with them in different departments or you're dealing with them, you know, on a day to day issue on other topics and and uh, but trying to get them up to speed. Uh, you know, what's needed and what's, uh, what's crucial in your communities is, is very, uh, is very necessary, right? How do you balance the needs of your community with the future growth of your community? Because I can imagine that is probably one of the challenging parts of the job, and it's probably not changed a lot over the 32 years that you've been in office, that the issues you're dealing with, you need to balance them with the realities that you're faced because after 32 years, you've, you've gone through numerous ups and downs through the economy, whether it be hard times, good times, and you have to balance the good times against the bad times. And right now we're in a bad time. People are struggling mm -hmm. and you don't want to do those wastewater projects, which could cost 80 to a hundred million dollars, depending on where you are in rural Newfoundland and Labrador on the backs of the people in your community when you have such a small tax base. Exactly. You know, just recently we've been talking about and, and I've been on the media about uh, the uh, wastewater influent uh, uh, regulations. And, and, you know, we're, we're, we're being forced to uh, uh, monitor our waste. And if you're uh, if you get lift stations or, or you know, uh, outfalls in your community, each one must be uh, monitored uh, for influent and see how much influent you got and see if it meets uh, qualifications for um uh, uh, future development and 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 where to go from there just to monitor a system you were talking over ten thousand dollars a year uh you know that's ten thousand dollars to be honest with you that we can you know spend on fixing the problem and not monitoring the problem we know that you know we do have one lift station that do need to be upgraded uh and and to spend ten thousand dollars just monitoring when you know that at the end of the day, yes, we do need to fix that, you know, situation. We don't want wastewater going out, raw sewage going out into the ocean. Uh, we want to fix that. Uh, but spending $10,000, over $10,000 a year just on that one, uh, you know, over a period of time, that's money that we could be putting towards fixing the problem. Uh, we got some communities who, you know, who spend a fifty to sixty to $80,000 a year just on monitoring. You know that that's a big part of their budget. That's a big part of their infrastructure that that can be uh, can be fixed with that bit of money that uh, that we're wasting. To be honest with you, and we need to we need that to change. You know what what's good for one is is should be good for the other one. So uh, so that's a big thing. That's one of the big problems that we're finding now, especially with water and wastewater. Okay, so. I I, I speak to municipal leaders from across Canada, and I do not want to paint a stroke when I ask this question. So please, if if anyone's listening, think that I'm asking this question just to pick on Dover. I'm not. I'm asking sure. this as a Canadian context. Has apathy changed in municipal politics in your time? Do you find more and more people just tuning out of what's going on at town hall or even wanting to get involved in the municipality? I, I, I remember a time back in like the early 2000s and like even late 1990s when I would go to a council meeting and I would see people at said council meeting. People would be in the council chambers. Now it's hard pressed. And I know people do live stream council meetings, but it's hard pressed to find people who actually get take an interest. In Dover, do you get the sense that people understand that we don't want to fix this we don't want to just monitor this lift station we want to actually fix it and people are going yes let's fix it or is there an apathy that says you know what as long as my water's turned on my gas my garbage is picked up i'm a happy camper yeah well you know at the end of the day i think that's that's where most of us really lie to is that you know if if 
you know, there's nothing wrong with the waters coming on my tap. If, if you know, my lights are still on, if, if the, the, you know, if, if the town is completing services, snow clearing and all that, that's all they want to know because that, that's, that, that, that's where they're too. Uh, you know, but in our community, we do have a lot of people that's interested in council. They're interested in, in making sure their town is, is availing of all services and they're getting, you know, what that, that bang for the buck at the end of the day, to be honest with you, uh, you know, recreational services or, or, or community services when it comes to, you know, not only the kids, but, you know, the adults uh, when it comes to, you know, wastewater and water and, and, and our roads and our road maintenance, um, you know, but I find sometimes, Chris, to be honest with you, when a town is, is like you said, doing, you know, not so good, uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to get involved, but when it's doing really good, a lot of people want to come on side and they want to take, the, you know, they want to get involved. So, uh, so that's good. But when people come in and ask questions, you know, uh, I, 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 I work with the public every day. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, a very public person. Um, and the job that I, I work at every day, um, you know, I see all of our, my residents in, in the community. So, uh, uh, you know, I can't get away from you know, comments or questions or anything like that. And, and I, and I like that because, you know, I've always believed in making sure the residents, you know, always got the truth. Uh, it's not, no worse when you're, you're, you're saying to the residents, uh, 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 an answer that you knows at the end of the day is not right, or, or you're just pleasing them by saying that answer, but you got to give them the, the, the truth and say, you know, this is what we can do. And this is why we're doing it. And if they don't agree, that's, that's, that's the best that you can do at the end of the day, right, Chris? Is it hard to balance that aspect of the job, though? Because I, I can imagine there's days that you have to make some very tough decisions around that council table, whether it be increasing taxes, whether it even mm -hmm. be increasing taxes one to two percent. Or yeah. we see some municipalities across Canada who raise their taxes 39 percent because it's yeah. just the way that things are happening right now. Is it hard when you have to make those tough decisions to go to the public and then continue on with your day to day lives because you are the closest to the people you don't go to St. John's you do not go to Ottawa to do your job. So you are the most accessible they can stop you at the grocery store or when you're working and say Tony we need to have a serious conversations about what yes. you voted on here. Is it hard to do that in a small community when you have to sort of be honest with them and mm -hmm. understand that they, they could be upset with the decisions you make. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that happens, you know, sometimes. Uh, but what's the frustrating part about it sometimes is, and I think you understand this, is that you know we we also take on a lot of the federal and provincial questions from people uh, in a municipality. You know, we 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 don't we don't work for that for that uh, that province or or, or or that political party. Uh, you know, we, we do our best in in uh, in our community, but we're the closest to the people and the people expects you to have the answers even if they're not you know from 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 an municipal point of view you know you, you're, you're still knowledgeable and you should be knowledgeable on federal and and, and provincial issues and uh, you know i've always reached out to you know the province or or, or our federal partners uh you know on municipal issues that people uh got a problem with especially you know if if you know you're somebody's looking at their their unemployment or they're working, you know, uh, in, uh, for their Canada pension plans or their all these pension plans is, uh, you know, I've always worked with those and, and, and helped a, a, a resident through that, uh, through that episode. But, you know, saying that, uh, we gotta be there for our residents, even though sometimes it's, it's like you said, it's, it's, it's hard, uh, you know, but we got a job to do. And I think most of the residents really understand that and, and they're there for you. Uh, and I can say that openly because, you know, after 32 years or, you know, serving the people in, in Dover, I, I believe that, you know, being honest and being there for those people, they understand that, you know, you're doing the best that you can. If not, I wouldn't be there to be honest with you. I want to turn to this uh, town of Dover as a whole now, but before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it as I always do. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. For those who are about to send me emails, because I get a few of them every time I speak to someone from Newfoundland or Labrador. Don't know why, but you guys seem very passionate about your municipal politics out there. I want to ask the question that is, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Dover today, mayor? To be honest, we are, you know, the biggest issues that we got, I, 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 and I can look back 32 years ago and it's the same issues, you know, when we, when we talk about infrastructure and making sure the infrastructure that we, uh, that we have here for our, for our, uh, our residents is up to date. 
uh, and the cost of it, to be honest with you, because, you know, uh, with the cost of everything now and the cost of living and, and, and materials, you know, it's just skyrocketed. Uh, and just making sure that we got the, the funds there available to, uh, you know, make sure our infrastructure is up to par. You know, we this year, we, this last year, we just we just finished a project with the provincial government on, um, you know, completing our uh, our roads with uh, new paving. Uh, you know, we we've we've put in some new um, uh, uh, water and sewage uh, lines, and 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 we fixed some of our our roads that you know we own our, our personal roads. Um, you know. And it's difficult uh, when it comes to you know, making sure that our infrastructure is up to par. But one of the big things now that we face is is our water and wastewater, to be honest with you. And I think we're not alone on that. Um, you know, uh, everybody in Newfoundland and especially, uh, you know, around coastal coastal uh, areas, uh, especially when it comes to climate and climate change. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've seen a lot of infrastructure, uh, you know, being destroyed by by. Uh, water surges and storm surges um you know that's something that you know we we work towards to make sure that you know we put armor stone in the right areas we we make sure that our infrastructure is took care of we do a lot of my you know uh, uh mitigating and making sure that you know our infrastructure is took care of so that you know if if we know way previously before storm even starts that uh, we're way ahead of the the the, the, the ball game right where we'll make sure that everything is done uh, finding monies is, is a problem, especially when you're in a small community, because, you know, Chris, like you said um, earlier, is, you know, when, when you're faced with a, with a budget, uh, that budget is pretty tight because we don't try to, you know, overspend on that budget. Uh, we got to have a balanced budget at the end of the day. And and, and when we do our, our yearly uh, at year in, our budget is, is, is balanced, uh, making sure the monies are there. And making sure that we don't overbear the, the, the our residents that's there because the cost of living now and, and the money that they're spending, you know, especially on fixed incomes is uh, is pretty tight. Have you had to put off uh, infrastructure projects in the past because of the money's just not there, as you've just openly said? Or are you trying to find uh, ways that you can grow your community, can can keep uh, those infrastructure uh, utilities that are currently there, whether they be roads or underground pipes, uh, maintained in a proper fashion so they don't become a bigger issue 20 years down the line? Is it a balancing act? And have you had to say, okay, unfortunately, we can't do these projects because the money's just not there? Yeah, yeah, we, you know, we've we've have done that in the past, and and you know, going back to to that uh, fire hydrant, uh, you know, uh, what I was just talking about the ten fire hydrants, we 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 had to cancel that pro that project because we we just couldn't handle the overruns on that. You know, we we were looking at uh, a cost to us, uh, and plus adding another seventy thousand dollars onto that cost is just that we 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 didn't have the money to do that. Uh, you know, and in the past, we've 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 stopped a couple of projects, to be honest with you, because, you know, we, we came in on one in one section of the community that was four million dollars. That was, you know, way out when when the engineers done the study um, and we had to cut that back a, a, a nice bit just to, to be able to put a, a sewage system into a uh, residential area uh, and cut out some things within that project so that uh, so that we can do that project for the residents and. Uh, you know, and we look at it now, we, you know, years ago, everybody looked at Cadillac systems, you know, putting in this beautiful system, you know, making sure that, you know, it, it was done up to the nines, to be honest with you, you know, nobody else had these projects or, or this infrastructure. Uh, we don't look at that anymore. We look at, you know, the, the base was needed and what can do the job. Uh, we don't believe in Cadillac systems, you know, just just give us something that's going to work and uh, and that we can afford. I want to talk about the flip side to the first question, which is, what do you boast about when it comes to the town of Dover? What's the thing that when you talk to other municipal leaders across the province or even across Canada that you say, you know what, you're doing it right, we're doing it better? What's that thing for Dover? To be honest with you, I, I think, you know, our people, you know, uh, you know what, what we have here, uh, our people is, is, you know, surpassed anybody else in with respects to, you know, you're loving your community and making sure we can get the, you know, what is needed in our community. Our tourism product is, is you know, top notch uh, when it comes to the Dover Fault and, and the, uh, and, and, you know, we, we can talk about, you know, the 9-11 episode, uh, you know, in, in Come From Away, you know, we, we promote that, uh, that dearly, you know, we had in the play itself, we have Nick and Diane who, who were stranded uh, passengers 
who came to Dover uh, on a tour of the uh, the Dover Fountain and realized that they were falling in love and and you know they 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 said to each other on the lookout here in Dover that you know they were falling in love and and they wanted you know to make more of their relationship which they did you know the year after they got married they came back and it's a big thing in the come from away play and we really promote that right um and uh, you know we we look at our uh, Dover fault uh, you know Dover fault is a, a 410 million year old geological fault in the earth's crust that uh you know in one side of the town we have uh, north america rock type and in the other part we have the uh, african and uh, asian rock type so uh you know it's a, it's a place where a lot of uh, young geologists come to do their theses when they're in college and in universities uh and we promote that a lot so uh you know it's it's I, I, when we talk about what other things got other towns got uh, I love all the, all the communities, you know, not, not only mine when it, when it comes to uh, in our province, because we all got something uniquely that we want to put out there uh, and finding finding some similarities uh, and what we got to uh, offer people is something that uh, that really works for all of us and that we can promote all together. Right? Is there a place in the community that you go to decompress after a long day, after a long day of work or a long day of council meetings? Is there a place that you can just go and decompress in? My my favorite place in 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 the town is on is on the look at the south. You can go up there and you just get that fresh air. You get that boost of you know real fresh air and energy that you need. You can look over the town and and see where it came from you know years ago and where it's going to. Um, that's one of the the places that I go to decompress. I don't go there every day, but you know uh, uh, I go there a lot to be honest with you. So after a long, long term, and I'm not saying term as in it's over, a long tenure in municipal office, what advice would you give the next generation of municipal leaders who are thinking about putting their name on the ballot? Because we have listeners in Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, Yukon, who are all going to municipal elections this year. Uh, yeah. What advice would you give to the next generation to say, do it? Yeah, well, you know, I'll... I'll, I'll tell people that, you know, who's, who's newly coming into municipal politics or who wants to come into municipal politics. It's like I tell them on any organization or, or any social, you know, organization they want to get involved with is that, you know, don't put your name on a ballot or, or don't get involved if you're not willing to spend the time uh, to serve and, uh, and listen to the public, listen to the people and don't go on councils, think that you got all the answers because there's no such thing, you know, and, and don't come in with a, with a personal agenda because it don't work. Uh, you know, come in wanting to do what's right for your community and making sure that, you know, you're there for the community, not your own self. You know, don't come in with self-interest. Come in with, with wanting to make sure that, you know, everybody in your community is took care of. And because let's not forget, at the end of the day, we live here too. You know, this is our community. This is at my home. My, you know, I pay the taxes here. I, I live here. And the service that I get is the same services that you get. And, uh, and we want to make sure that, you know, don't put your name on a ballot because you just wants to, to put your name on a ballot. Put your name on a ballot because you want to make a difference in your community. After 32 years in office, have you been able to sort of identify who could be a good leader and who uh, is doing it for those that that one issue candidate, that that candidate who's just doing it for the sort of no, I don't want to say wrong reason because everyone has the right to put their name on the ballot and whatever reason they believe in, but is doing it for that one issue rather than doing it for their community? Well, you come across people sometimes, you know, who come on with, with, with their personal agendas. But, you know, <laughs> after, a while, after a while, they, they find out that, you know, councils do have rules. We do have regulations. And, and uh, you know, it, it's the betterment of, of council in our community if you all work together. Uh, the council that I've been working with now for the last three years, uh, you know, and, and prior to that, the last four years, uh, have been, uh, you know, we've been all on the same page. We, you know, it, it's 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 easy to to sit down and have that communication with with those councillors because I think we all need and we all know that you know what's needed in our community and we strive for that. Uh, not saying that we can't, you know, new people can come on. I'd love to have new people. I I, I speak to you know residents in my community often and say, you know, our, our election is next year. Uh, you know, think about putting your name forward. You know, there's nothing wrong with. Uh, uh, getting new blood on council, new ideas, and and uh, and moving forward. Uh, you know th that's what we all need because I'm not going to be here forever. I I got no plans of being on on council forever. I didn't know I was going to be here for this long. To be honest with you, I got on for that term years ago, and and uh, I just loved it. And 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 I think that was a passion that you know when you love something is is 
it's really not a job. It's 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 something that you enjoy going to, to be honest with you, right, Frank? Uh, right there, I, Chris? I, I like that you say that uh, 32 years is a long time, where in reality it's not, because we have the former, the current mayor of the town of Milton, Ontario, who's been there for 72 years. So <laughs> you're just a young buck compared to some people serving in the municipal <laughs> realm. <laughs> Before I let you go, I have one last question for you. It's the million dollar question. We started by talking about you. We're ending by talking about the town of Dover. What makes the town of Dover such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family, Tony? You know, I, I, I'll, I'll say it. And I'll say it over and over. It's because of the people. It's you know, it's because of of the uniqueness of our community. You know, we we live on the ocean. We live on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, you know, our our, our kids play outdoors. Uh, uh, freedom is is wonderful uh you know there's no such thing as you gotta you know watch the traffic or you gotta watch everybody knows everybody now that's that's a good and bad sometimes you know it's it's like everywhere but uh yeah no uh i, I think dover's got what you know what it takes when it comes to welcoming new people to our community and uh, and making sure we take care of each other uh because at the end of the day chris that's who we got to depend on each each, each other so that's what uh that's one thing about Dover that I, I, I love and, uh, and very, uh, you know, um, appreciate. Tony, it has been a pleasure to sit down with you and pick your brain about municipal politics, well, not only about municipal politics, but about yourself and about the town of Dover. I'm looking forward to coming out. Hopefully I can actually book a proper plane ticket this year to make it to St. John's, Newfoundland instead of St. John's, New Brunswick, because, you know, yeah. I don't know how to book a plane ticket. I should get the people who are in the system to do that. Uh, but I'm looking forward to meeting you in person that later this year, okay? You too. Now, if today's interview sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations here on the cross-border interviews or even our eye-opening exploration of local governance and the decisions they make in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in expanding the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, and as always, just keep talking.